Hello, 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 and welcome to the Canadian Outdoor Learning Spring Virtual Workshop Series. What a fantastic waterfall of humans, 164 and counting. Thank you so much for taking time out of your afternoon, evening uh, to join with us. Just wait for a second and enjoy these spring sounds as we let people come in. Okay, let's kick things off. Hi everybody and welcome. My name's Jade Harvey Beryl and I'm part of the team at the Outdoor Learning Store. So we're a charitable uh, non-profit social enterprise offering outdoor learning equipment and resources for educators and learners, uh, whilst also then funneling everything back into supporting other outdoor learning non-profit organisations. I also work closely with Take Me Outside and they're our partner in delivering this workshop. I join you today from the traditional and unceded territories of the Snikest people. Um, where I live, uh, the Snikest word is Kahikan, which means where the ridgeline meets the water. I'm in interior BC Revelstoke, uh, where I have the Selkirks up to my east and the Monashi Mountains to the west, and both ridgelines meet down at the uh, Columbia River. This land has also been hunted, fished, gathered upon and cherished uh, by three other First Nations. They're the Sequetmik, the Okanagan Silks and the Tanaha people. And actually this place for the Tanaha is the land of the Muskakas or the Chickadee. And I live next to the Chickadee or Columbia River. I'm deeply grateful um, to be able to live here and work here. Uh, and uh, it's important to recognize that uh, this land is not my own. Diving into that a bit more, we know that in the context of outdoor learning where we are, it's fundamental to develop our understanding of local traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, and the perspectives of indigenous people have called this place home for millennia. And so if it's relevant to you, we encourage you um, firstly to consider what you can to do to deepen your understanding if you're working on the land. And in this moment, you could share in the chat what indigenous territories you're joining us from. Today, um, we'd like to extend a very special welcome uh, to those who've committed to the Every Child Matters year-long learning challenge. So this is a challenge that encourages um, learning about Indigenous perspectives beyond just the one day on September 30th. And participants commit to making their learning journey uh, on Indigenous knowledge, perspectives, history and culture, and take it as an ongoing part of their lives. Uh, this work is foundational to outdoor learning for us, and so we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge their commitment to this work. Final point on that, that today, uh, May 12th, is also known as Moose Hide Campaign Day. I'm wearing my Moose Hide Square here. Uh, the Moose Hide campaign is committed to ending violence against women and children, um, particularly Indigenous women and children. Uh, the inspiration for the campaign came to co-founders Paul and his daughter Raven in 2011, uh, when they were on a moose hunt on the traditional carrier territory along the Highway of Tears in northern British Columbia. Their annual gatherings bring together people from across Turtle Island or North America in ceremony, taking collective action to end violence towards women and children. So they bring indigenous medicine with real moose hide squares and to cure uh, this modern sort of Canadian illness of, of these women being taken and murdered. So according to their research, uh, on average, each moose hide pin starts 10 conversations and Justin Trudeau's warned them and various uh, political stages. So if everybody wears one, that's 30 million conversations about ending violence that wouldn't have happened. And so due to the this commitment and this campaign, more people are talking about and addressing violence against the Indigenous women and girls, tackling systemic racism and working towards reconciliation. So their aim is to have distributed 10 million moose hide squares by the end of 2023. Uh, and there's some links going to the chat now where you can find them. They post them for free. You can wear them in your organization. You can wear them every day. I'm wearing mine with a B pin for no mo may so that we can protect uh, our native pollinators as well. But um, I just encourage you to take a moment to check out their work because it's incredible. I'll pass over to Steph to say hello. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Uh, and it is my first time co-hosting these workshops with Jade. I'm taking over. If you've been through them before, you might have seen Farheen from the from Take Me Outside. And I'm the, the program coordinator for Take Me Outside. And it's wonderful to be here. Uh, so I'm representing Take Me Outside and our 30 plus outdoor learning partners. 
Uh, so lovely to uh, be presenting this workshop and to see people entering territories from all over the place, uh, not just Canada, our audience goes beyond that, which is just totally heartening. There's so many passionate folks in one room. Uh, and I'm joining you from southeastern British Columbia, and what's currently known as Robson, and that is the traditional territory of the Sinaiks, the Silks Okanagan, and the Tunaha peoples. And uh, I'm going to pass it back over to Jade. I will be um, collecting questions and things in the chat, but Jade will uh, introduce that more in a second. Steph. So I think a massive silver lining of this two challenging years of a pandemic is that actually the growth in virtual workshops, being here with over nearly 250 people from all across our country and the rest of the world has enabled more people to join us who are maybe underrepresented yeah. or remote. Uh, and the passion that we see when all these people joining together makes me feel more connected than ever. So thank you for being here and being a part of our community. We're almost diving into the real um, main event here, but just bear with me for a few minutes. Zoom 101, um, you can type any questions or any um, technical things into the chat. Steph and I are working behind the scenes to collate them, and we're going to do a Q&A pose to Heidi and Gillian at the end of the session. Uh, so please stay muted, but please leave your video on. It's nice to present to some faces. It feels uh, more real and more connected. Um, if you want to change the view, top right of your screen, you'll see a view button or three dots, and you can click on that and go between gallery or speak of you, and you'll be able to see uh, change up your view. If you're having any questions, just uh, send me a little message into the chat and we'll help you out. We are recording this and uh, the recording will be sent out in a follow-up email this evening. If you don't have it in your inbox by tomorrow morning, check your spam. Sometimes we go there very sadly. Okay, so we asked about Indigenous acknowledgements, but I'm just going to ask um, in case people aren't sure or what's happening um, to share where you're joining us from in the more traditional or less traditional sense, modern Western sense that we might be well, I'm just going to count down for 10 seconds and let's see where we have. Currently, we have a representative of every pair except Northern Canada and Alaska. Uh, oh, there we go. One. OK, just five more seconds. Got about 75 percent. OK, I'm going to close it now. I'm going to share the results with you. So look, we've got fantastic representation, Western and Eastern Canada, but there's somebody from everywhere. If you're rest of the world, please type in the chat where you're from, because um, we'd love to know where we're reaching you. And the second question really quickly here is, who are you? I'm really interested to see who's in the audience with us today. Got some formal educators, young, all the way to grade 12, some community and formal educators assistants, admin staff, family, not an educated people, just passionate. Thank you for joining us and spreading the good word. Teacher candidate, okay, in the chat there, I like it. Some recreational, oh, look at this. And then I just count down for another five seconds. And we're ending it there. I'll just share the results just so you can see that, you know, what's amazing to me is that so many different, such diversity of people are being represented. So uh, I'm so pleased that you could all join us this evening. Okay, so I'm just going to really quickly um, share my screen for just a moment. So welcome everybody to the main event. This is Walking Forward, Indigenous Perspectives and Learning in Place with Imagined and the network of inquiry and indigenous education. I'm just gonna run through, we have over 30 outdoor learning partners. I'm just gonna whiz through them. And then there's a link in the chat. If you need resources, if you need support, they're all here for you. Take Me Outside, PAX Fun, Ecom. Green Teacher Natural Curiosity, Green Learning, Water Rangers, Sea Bean, Ipsa, Wild Sight, Geoc, Sask Outdoors. ACE, Stoked on Science, Get Outside and Play, OC, Classrooms to Communities, KBE, Learning for a Sustainable Future, Eco Schools Canada, Imagine Ed, Leave No Trace Canada, Nature for All, Megan Zenny, the NBEN, CPAWS, the Outdoor Council of Canada, OceanWise, Project WET, Interpretation Canada, the Interpretive Guides Association, 
Nature Kids BC, Project Learning Tree Canada, and we've now got four and growing uh, fantastic uh, American affiliates and partners joining us. I'll just let you have a quick look there. And I just wanted to reiterate our Every Child Matters year long learning challenge. You pick a day each week to wear orange and you provide time, resources and opportunities for your staff to deepen their knowledge. We're going to be running this again. Um, and I highly recommend it with um, a lot of diving deep and um, with Indigenous advisors helping shape that content. And so here we go. I'm going to introduce our fantastic presenters. First up is Heidi Wood. She's an Indigenous Education Curriculum Coordinator with the Delta School District number 37 and a long-time participant with the Network of Inquiry in Indigenous Education. As an educator with mixed First Nations and European ancestry, it's her goal to support teachers with a deeper understanding of Indigenous perspectives in the BC curriculum. She strives to model the first people's principles of learning in her work as she engages in experiential learning for all. And uh, an absolute firm favourite and just someone that we always welcome into the workshop space, Dr. Gillian Judson. She's the assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University. She teaches in educational leadership and curriculum and instruction programmes. Her scholarship looks at imagination's role in leadership and learning from kindergarten to post-secondary. And of course, she's written got the most incredible website with Imagine Ed. She's written the walking curriculum and other books, just really fantastic. And so I welcome you both. Thank you for joining us. So I'm gonna stop my share and give them the opportunity to set up. We know that with this many people on the line, sometimes it just takes a little moment for the education. So I'll just reiterate questions in the chat, mute, but keep your faces on. I see lots of fantastic faces and Heidi and Gillian, your screen looks good to go. I'm going to mute and pass it over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my heart is so full, first of all, because 259, 60, it keeps going, someone's in, out, someone's in, out, someone's in, out, are here today to learn about this work. Um, and I'm just so thrilled. And um, many hundreds more want to follow up with the recording. And my heart is especially full because I get to share um, an incredible learning experience um, that I've been having learning alongside Heidi Wood. So I'm going to be working the slides today and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Heidi to lead us off. Thanks, Jillian. So we are. Um... So thank you, by the way, Jade, for that beautiful acknowledgement to territory that you did. And this is an important part of the work that we do, particularly um, in looking at reconciliation and our reciprocal relations that we can have to learn about Indigenous culture, people's history. And I want to share with you uh, mine. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Swasin Masteo and the uh, Musqueam Indian Band. These are the traditional territories from which I work and live from. I honor a deep connection to place and place is a big important part of the work that we've been doing here. And so I honor this connection to place on these territories of all Hunkaminam speaking peoples who have been the caregivers and living in relationship with this land since time immemorial. I honor and show respect for the teachings of our ancestors as I continue to do this learning. I'm mindful to continue walking forward in a good way, learning from the generations who have walked before me and making sure that I'm doing the same for the seven future generations to come. I'm a visitor here on this particular territory from Haida Gwaii, and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to be able to grow and engage in the teachings of reconciliation here and to do more learning. I make a commitment to my own learning um, by understanding the place in which I'm honored to work from, but also in continuing the learning of the Haida language and the Haida culture from where I grew up. I also want to acknowledge the more recent events and bring awareness to uh, May 5th, which was the day for murdered missing Indigenous women, girls and two spirit. And also today to acknowledge Moose Hide campaign and recognize that these, um, these days are, are across the nation, and they're not just for one day. We need to do this every day. I also want to acknowledge the many communities, families, and loved ones who are waiting for the return 
of the young children remain in unidentified graves among the Indian residential schools and institution sites. I say these words because it's really important to me that I follow um, some of the teachings by Dr. Dustin Louie, who, who said that when we share an acknowledgement, what we're actually doing is making a commitment to do the learning of reconciliation. And by saying those words out loud, we're also asking those that are listening to help us be accountable to that work and to recognize that if we are hearing those words, that we are willing to take part in the engagement around understanding, learning, and continuing to develop these respectful relationships with Indigenous peoples for whose territory we are on. So Hella, thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, and I'm joining today from the Kwatlin, Katsi, and Semiamu First Nations peoples. And um, for me, my journey involves um, many days spe spent out on the land in the local parks. And it's also very much uh, augmented by using the walking practices that we're going to talk about today and really slowing down and feeling our connections, our visceral connections to the land. And uh, that's definitely at the heart of what you're gonna hear about today is enriching our imaginative and emotional connections with the land and the place. Doing this work with Heidi has been uh, central to my own walking forward towards reconciliation. As a white settler on these unsurrendered lands, it takes time um, and I need someone to walk with me with kindness as Heidi always does, to help me expand and develop a two-eyed way of seeing the world. And so for all of you here today who are in the process of learning and doing that, I applaud you. It's difficult work and it is nothing more worthwhile. So we are going to share today a resource that you will all have access to. And it began, right Heidi, over coffee. Because Heidi and I go way, uh, way back. Heidi took her master's in imaginative education uh, with me as her supervisor many years ago at, at Simon Fraser University. And so we both have a deep love for and commitment to the role of imagination in learning. And so I believe we got together probably seven or eight years after you'd finished and we sort of said, there's work to be done here. How do you remember that first meeting, Heidi? I remember that your walking curriculum had come out and I reached out to you and said, oh my gosh, this is amazing, but I think we missed the boat. We need to have a deeper conversation. You went, yes, we do. Yeah. And so we went and had coffee and decided that this wasn't just about a conversation over coffee, that this needed to take on something bigger, mm -hmm. something where we could share a bit more of the learning. But it also was something that we recognized we needed to lean into some of our colleagues to help us do the work with. So 100%, I mean, Heidi came along at a time when I, I've done a lot of thinking and work with Western perspectives on place-based ecological education, which is a sort of a sliver of Western pedagogical history. Um, and I hadn't bridged into, moved into experience the indigenous um, land and place focused perspectives, which are at the heart of that kind of pedagogy. So we started to do that together. And what we brought were a few shared beliefs. One was in teacher curiosity and inquiry and the power of curiosity and inquire, inquiry for transformation. We had a shared belief in the role of imagination for learning and we both deeply felt that an authentic and emotionally engaging way for students to really learn about the first people's principles of learning would be through an imaginative kind of a pedagogy. So we began. And it was a wonderful beginning. And we actually began by inviting a number of, of uh, teachers to come and have conversations with us. So we took these conversations around understanding place. And when we talk about place, you know, we capitalize this, this place because it's more than just geography. Um, it really, was a sense of understanding the history, the stories, the culture, the language, the deep connections that we have to uh, the land in many different ways. And we wanted to really understand what that was like from kids and using the walks. Um, we really wanted to make sure that the work that we were doing not only honored 
understanding the imagination, but it also really looked at the relationship that we have with human, non-human um, within that place. Absolutely. So we capitalize place in, in an effort to give it subjecthood in the language we use. We There's an honoring when we capitalize. And so that is why we will always encourage you to capitalize place, to capitalize nature, to capitalize earth. Oh, sorry. Somehow I went too far. Does that go back fully? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we had 14 educators in seven schools across the Surrey School District, really a broad area geographically. And together, those educators um, worked with 175 youth learners. I had started off working in the Surrey School District um, and have transferred to Delta. So that's why the, the Surrey School District came in. And, and Surrey is a very large district, um, actually the largest in BC. And so we knew that we had a number of, of eager educators that would be able to help us with this learning and, and to really walk alongside with us. We developed four collaborative workshops and, and they really were very collaborative. At the beginning of each workshop, we talked a little bit about imagination, but we also talked a lot about Indigenous perspectives and knowledge and how we made those connections to understanding the land and the relationship with the land around us. And each of these workshops built upon each other. And it was a time for everyone to come together to share what they had learned, to look at new resources, and to really begin to understand the spiral of inquiry, which was the framework that we used. So you spoke a little bit about it. I want to say anything more about the spiral? Yeah, um, there are over six phases that we, we work with. And the intention of the spiral is to dive deeply into um, some of the learning. And it begins with this understanding of making sure that we are creating opportunities for students to graduate with opportunity and success in many different ways. And we really want this to be a place of belonging. And we knew that we could do that with the connections that we had uh, to understanding place. And each of the four sessions dove into one of those phases. And we really talked about that connection um, through story. And I think if you'd like to learn more about the spiral of inquiry, you'll, you'll read about it in the resource and the work of the network of inquiry and indigenous education. So that was a central part of our work. Um, and next was the for people's principles of learning. And it was our intention to always connect the um, activities the, the teachers were doing with students, the not just the activities, the disposition, their mindsets as they were developing the work to different principles of learning and in ways that engaged imagination explicitly. So the first people's principles of learning is actually how our new BC curriculum um, has been used to help frame the learning. And this is a, it's a way in which we can look and understand learning. It's not meant to be taught, it's meant to be modeled. And that's what um, the colleagues that were actually participating, the 14 teachers that took this on, that's what they were doing. And so the other thread throughout this is the commitment to imagination. And I mentioned that Heidi did a master's degree in imaginative education. So if anybody's um, new to the walking curriculum, within it, there's discussion of how we can intentionally engage imagination. There are tools to do this. And Kieran Egan's work has been groundbreaking for many of us because he's really made it clear the kinds of ways the human mind engages the imagination as young children or language users, literate people, philosophical thinkers. And so what makes the walking curriculum unique, um, different from place-based practices and what makes imaginative ecological education unique is that it is applies cognitive tools, storytelling, imagery, rhythms, patterns, games, drama, all of these very specific tools to outdoor and intentional place focused practices. So when we were using the walks in here, each walk has a theme of inquiry, but it also has a cognitive tool. And if you're interested in that language, you can learn more about it in our resource, or you can follow some of the links that are provided. We really found that with those cognitive tools, they aligned quite deeply within the first people's principles and this understanding of how we can um, look at learning and connections with the land through the lens of Indigenous perspectives. So there was a beautiful relationship between them already, which made this work a natural fit to come together. 
the actual resource. Um, this is sort of a, a little snapshot of what it looks like the table of contents, which we aren't calling the table of contents, we call it the story because that's really how it felt. It felt like we were telling a story from beginning to end and, and that we're sort of on chapter two now. Um, you know, that the series continues. So we have at the beginning a section about the beginnings. It just really outlines what we've been what we've been sharing now and it talks about the roots of the project. Uh, within each section, you'll see some reflections from teachers that participated, and then you'll see out on the land the walking activities that have the Indigenous perspective connected with them. Uh, I want to acknowledge a colleague of mine, Gwenael Ogerblak, who is doing a French translation for us. I believe she's probably on the call today as well, and so just really so grateful for the work that you're doing to help bring that forward um, in French, yes. <laughs> so merci, my friend. Um, we also have a website that we've put together with an extension of many of these walks. So that website will be up and running with all the walks, we hope by June 1st, we've got most of them up there now, as well as links to a variety of the different resources that we used with those teachers. So yes, in the, in the resource itself, the glossy, beautiful, resource um there's seven or eight that are framed seven or eight of the first set of walks from the walking curriculum but if you go to this other site you'll see the first 30 um reframe with that indigenous lens and so as you go through these are a few snippets of the book uh that we've created you'll see that there's the three threads inter are interwoven we have our indigenous ways of knowing and each walk is linked to a first people's principle We've got the cognitive tool piece, specifically, how are we engaging imagination? And we're always coming back to the connection between place and wellness, wellness of ourselves, but very importantly, wellness of the earth. And we really both believe strongly that those two are deeply, deeply connected. And we can't go without saying that a lot of this work around rethinking and envisioning these walks also came with my partner, uh, Nadine McSpadden from the Surrey School District. We were both curriculum coordinators and, and this was something that we had taken on and we were so grateful to be able to do the work with Jillian and with these 14 educators. And that's where all 30 of these walks came and they all bring this th uh, these three threads through them. So I think we're going to share a couple. Um, I, I could speak quickly to the mud, the mud squish. I love the mud squish. The mud squish was a project um, with some teachers at George Greenway with their K-1 students. And it was really about um, unleashing students' curiosity when they're outdoors exploring. And one day, rather than walking past that the muddy section, they paused and they really dove into an inquiry into mud. The students named that location the squish, the mud squish area. And their particular reflection talks about that sort of the sense of joy in learning and the senses. And for me personally, it's a sort of a, a vision for what we would like learning to be more about. Um, I love that it's messy. I think all learning is messy. And I love that it is what the students really wanted in that moment. I think one of the exciting things for me that came out of this mud squish was that connection to the Indigenous knowledge and perspective and the students actually learned that mud can be medicinal and that mud is used in multiple ways um, from Indigenous perspectives and knowledge, thinking about how, um, you know, right from architecture to art to medicine, and that was something that was really exciting for many of the students. This uh, one was from Royal Heights, I believe. There was a few examples from Royal Heights. Uh, this is particularly touching one because there's two giant cedars around the school and they created a, a routine, a, a, an honoring routine at the beginning and the end of every week in which they began and ended the week honoring the cedars. And they didn't refer to them as the cedars, but cedars. Um, personifying subjecthood to these trees and they did a circle of learning that included the cedars and so for me I find that a very touching uh, reflection from those um, educators. I think uh, when we talk about the cedars you know here from an Indigenous perspective the cedar actually is um, referred to as the tree of life and the connection that we make with the offerings of the cedar in being able to live in relationship with, with the cedar as part of our community and how many um, different ways in which the cedar is able to give 
And this was something that the students all took away and it was embedded with these ideas of the four R's of respect, responsibility, relevance, and reciprocity. I think we have one more example in here, Heidi. Did you think want to- so. Yes. So this one came from Goldstone and um, the teacher, Shane Reader, was it actually ended up being quite a large spiral and they, the students ended up publishing their own book on this as well and it actually was rooted in this idea of reconciliation and the students wanted to learn about the land in which the school was on and they started to go out on a regular daily basis and then they started to think about what else can the land offer they wanted to go and they wanted to learn about different pieces and they decided to do uh, a little bit of a thematic approach using art photography um, primarily and math and thinking about the learning that they could do using photography and math. And they started to go outside and understand the different aspects of uh, math using nature as the teacher and the textbook, as opposed to sitting down in the classroom. What was so wonderful about this was the student's ability to incorporate the language then into so many other areas of their learning. And it it ended up coming into their science lessons and into their socials lessons and they did weaving with it and um, it really became a huge part of who they were and as a result they ended up doing their own territorial acknowledgement which is being used uh, so that they could really demonstrate that act of reconciliation. And so our, our process has been a long one. It began with the coffee and, and what's our vision. And we wanted to geographically invite around, around the school district and then the student, the workshops with the teachers and forward, 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 pandemic or two. And now, and now a series, we decided to take the draft of the resource you'll be seeing. And we led a series with um, some educators. I think we ended up having 15 or so. And we met five times and we would um, introduce a different walk and a first people's principle for learning. And we had feedback and their experiences using the resource. We really wanted their feedback on, on how they felt about the resource, what their reactions to it, was and I'm I'm not sure who might be in the audience today from that series but if you were here and you wanted to speak up it would be wonderful but I'm not sure if I think COVID got a few of our planned speakers so they may not be here but if anybody was willing and you wanted to to speak up at this point I could give a little wait time I was always told in my teacher ed that my wait time was too short. They always told me that. Um, so if you if you are here and you'd like to share, please please let us know. It's a little intimidating with just shy of three hundred people. Um, did you want to speak to some of our feedback, Heidi? Yeah, and actually, it's kind of funny because I am going to acknowledge that. Oh my gosh, I found a spelling mistake. I didn't find it today. My colleague Cody found it. I'm like, no. So a lot. Of <laughs> A lot of the feedback wasn't about spelling mistakes or typos, and I do want to acknowledge uh, Cody Forbes, who is my colleague here in Delta, who made it look so beautiful for us, and the typo was all mine, not his. Um, and uh, I, I, I think a lot of our feedback came around so grateful to be able to go out on the land and do these walks over and over and over again, and each time there was a different perspective that could be brought back in. So that was one of the pieces, just really grateful to have that opportunity to apply the Indigenous perspective, to think about Indigenous knowledge, and to make those connections with imagination and wellness. Um, there was lots of writing because the teacher reflections were phenomenal. There's quotes from students, there's quotes from teachers. And, you know, one of the comments was, there's so much writing, there's so much thinking. And we had to actually cut down the writing. Uh, we, we had said originally to every teacher, okay, two page, two page. And it's like, okay, six pages, six pages. <laughs> so there is a lot of writing and there isn't always a lot of pictures because we were um, you know, recognizing that we were working with students and not every student always has permission for photos. So that was sort of two key takeaways was there's so much to dive into and think about and that the walks really allowed for the, um, the connection to place to be really open and, and provide many different perspectives. I think for me, and it may just be how I read it, some of the feedback, which was sort of a critique was actually a compliment because it was like more, 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 um, which is great. And lots of ideas for expanding and developing the work, which we can always do with, part with, with others' participation. 
Um, so I'm afraid we may not have people here today, or we might, maybe we'll get to that through the uh, questions. Where can you get it? Well, you have it. I believe all participants were um, sent an attachment and we also have it on the NOI website and it's on the ImagineEd website where you would look at the walk-in curriculum and it would it is in a PDF format right now. We do invite and welcome. If you do notice another typo, you know, there's always one. Hashtag always one typo. Then we just need to know because we can change that and we'll upload it. Um, but I think we're at this point, Heidi, are we not ready to maybe invite some questions and comments? Absolutely. Okay, oh yeah, I even have a slide for that. One more typo <laughs> hashtag, please reach out. Um, here are our emails as well uh, to speak with Heidi or myself. Thank you so much. Beautiful, beautiful. And for those of you who haven't seen it, just scroll up a tiny bit. I'll just copy it and paste it right there again. Boom. There's the link to the PDF. Get in there, have a look, download it. You can even have a peek now while you're figuring it out. Um, but I think we were just so absorbed in what you were saying and the beautiful storytelling of it that uh, I don't have any questions for you yet. So if anyone's got any questions, type them in the chat right now. I'm Lots having of one of those you. moments where I, I interact with people on Twitter and then I see them in real life and I'm going to shout out to Mia Motri or is it Maya? I've never had said your name out loud. Is it Mia or Maya? It's Mia Mutre. Mia Mutre, <laughs> nice to see you. It's so good to see you. I see you on Twitter, but I don't really. And I Thank see you. David Arnhem there. Hey, David, good to see you. Thank you all so much for being here. If you have any comments, questions, thoughts, we'd love to hear them. Oh, I even see my cousin. Hello, Tina. <laughs> just everyone's just saying thank you because they're so uh, in awe. Do you, oh, what's that? Can you share your email addresses again, please, for a moment? Perhaps you could type them in the, sure. in the chat. I'll put my email in the chat. I, I always welcome feedback and... For me, uh, not having an enrolling class, I am at SFU, it, it's really through being in connection with, with educators that this magic happens. And I'm also deeply invested in researching how we're transitioning to schools that are supporting eco-social justice. So if you're a leader and you're interested in eco-social justice or supporting that in your school, please reach out to me because I'd love to talk to you um, and connect you with others that are like-minded in that way. You don't mind just because there were little snippets of it, but if you if you haven't had a chance to have a peek, I'm just sharing. This is the resource here, so it's got that beautiful picture, and there's some beautiful forwards. There's that story again, um, and there's some beautiful context to take you into it. Some roots connecting into the work and the research that Gillian and Heidi do. Uh, and then here we are, it breaks it down into these beautiful sort of photographic and descriptive inquiries. Um, it's really just beautiful to read. Like I just had a cup of tea and a biscuit and just read through and just felt my heart warm from, from the demonstrations and from the activities. And as a British person who says lovely about a thousand times um, a day, uh, you know, to have a lovely and unlovely walk is, is super important. So I know you're not going to scroll through the whole thing. There's, um, you know, how long do we get to? 45 pages. There's a bunch of references at the end, um, but it's a really beautiful resource. And just how lucky are we uh, to have access to that? So and dive in. We do have... Um we do have the names of those amazing 14 educators who did the work. Um, and we did invite them to be here today, but um, they might be a little timid or busy, very busy if you're an educator. We do have some questions coming through the chat at this point as well. Oh, beautiful. So question, thanks for um, capitalizing that because normally they're just hidden in there and we just copy and paste. So Katie's asking, can you describe how you introduce the principle of reconciliation to young students? And how would you potentially talk about this with preschool aged kids? I think um, it, it, that's a fabulous question because it's one that, that we get asked from teachers K to 12, right? And I'm sure even post-secondary, um, it comes up. 
So when we're working with some of the younger students, we really talk about reconciliation as ways in which we can create reciprocal relationships of respect and think about Indigenous knowledge that we can share. So a lot of the times that will be connecting with a story for students and having them understand some of the teachings that goes with that particular story and talking about reconciliation is ways that we can um, help make things better for Indigenous people in the future um, because sometimes recognizing that it wasn't always a good relationship in the past. Uh, and that's that's one of the ways that we can do that. And we do that by connecting with the land. Beautiful. Anything to add, Julian, or I'll move on to the next question. No, I think that's a good that's a question I'm considering too. How do we introduce reconciliation to anyone of any age, honestly, um, in a way that that honors the complexity of it and, and holds space for the complexity of it because we can't feel like we can rush in and, and fix this, um, but we can, we can walk forward in, in the right, in a right way. So I think it's an important question for all ages, for sure. Thank you, Heidi. I think of course we make it age appropriate, right? So as we get older, you know, I'm, I'm going to deal with it differently with adults than I would with, with the, you know, five-year-old or a six-year-old, but we have to also give children credit. They are incredibly open-hearted and sometimes it's, I don't want to say the word easier, but it's easier to work with children around understanding what is reconciliation, what is reciprocal relationships, what does that look like when we want to change relationships to be respectful. Um, oftentimes it's the youth that have the better ideas and are more willing. Beautiful. So, so important. They don't have the guilt. They don't have the societal guilt that we hold on to that, that gets in the way of communication and, and reconciliation mm -hmm. so that ties into another question about how broad was the age range of the youth learners in these examples in the um in your program it was actually kindergarten to seven so we did this with an ele with elementary schools we didn't do this with any secondary that doesn't mean that we haven't been doing the work with secondary i've been doing quite a bit of work um, with secondary using the walks and really having this understanding of place and what those connections are using uh, the cognitive tools. So we, we go out quite regularly, but this particular um, activity, this, this particular walking forward was done with elementary K to seven. Katie asks, do you have any picture books or children's books that you would recommend to implement this curriculum? If you don't, I have a bunch from the store. <laughs> Right. I was just going to say you have an incredible selection on the store website that leans into the Indigenous perspectives and knowledge and the sharing and the stories. And I think, um, you know, just being really mindful to make sure that the resources are always authentic, being written by and the knowledge shared by an Indigenous author, sharing their own understanding and their own perspectives. Um, we don't want to ever put words in someone's mouth that aren't our own. Um, so really making sure that the work is authentic. Uh, FNESC, uh, F-N-E-S-C, the First Nations Education Steering Committee, also has a great resource for uh, authentic resources that you can download for free. And you can take a look at different resources on there as well. And all of them are um, have been approved and, and reviewed for its authenticity. So whatever resources you're using, just make sure that they are authentic. Beautiful. And yes, so on the store, um, we have a partnership with Strong Nations. They're an Indigenous owned and operated publishing house on Vancouver Island. Uh, and they have their own and you can look at their own um, uh, sort of standards for authenticating resources and actually having Indigenous voices uh, as, their, as their producers and their presenters and their creators. So, yeah, that's a really important thing for us uh, to uplift Indigenous voices. And just when you look, if you're looking at the website too, you know, Strong Nations has three levels of, of um, looking at authentic, uh, authenticity. Um, we're looking at content, right? So if there is an Indigenous artist, it doesn't mean that the book is authentic in terms of the sharing of knowledge. And that's a really important piece to keep in mind. It means that the artwork is authentic, not the knowledge. And so we really want to make sure that, that that's um, something that's looked at very closely and clearly. Beautiful, thanks for um, specifying that. 
-hmm. So Noel, um, I wanted to say the day together and Cedar was beautiful. Uh, I'd like to know what grade that was um, that created that work and engaged in that. Which, which walk was it? It was the Cedar Gathering. Oh, the Cedar Gatherings. Okay, that was, was grade five. It was grade, there was two of them. So there was a grade four and a grade five class. And there was some combined work and some buddy work that went on um, from three to six that went with that. Just saying that buddy work is wonderful for walking work. It's a great way to do buddy, buddy combinations. Talking of buddies, Bernadine says, I'm wondering if the teachers thought their students felt a greater sense of safety by how your resource works to create a sense of belonging. Which I think is just a compliment rather than a question. Um, <laughs> but I'm with you. Um, you know, that safety and that security and feeling connected. Did you get good feedback? Yes, Jillian. I was just going to say that I think the more we open ourselves up to relating to place and, and acknowledging that we are in community with the places in which we live, there is and can be an inherent sense of belonging. I did write something for Green Teacher maybe last fall where I talk about collaborating with place doesn't mean that you're out there with a human teacher and figuring out what to do it means you might be out there collaborating with place your silent co teacher. Um, so I personally believe and I know there's a lot of research to back it up that when we all en enhance our relationships with the land and the natural environment, we can feel a sense of belonging now is that the same kind of sense of belonging we feel from humans. I don't know it's a fascinating question. I would think that the people in this room would support natural relationships as supporting belonging. I, I think we're kind of the choir, aren't we? <laughs> I, would agree. I know that with the Royal Heights schools, with the Cedar, um, the two Cedar stories in there, uh, the students really did feel a sense of agency and a sense of belonging. And as a result, they wanted to make sure that they were taking care of the land, that they were living in that relationship with the land that we had talked about. Not being stewards of the land, which is something that we were encouraging the students to think sort of beyond. Um, being stewards of the land, caring for the land as it is now, isn't, um, it's a colonial frame. And so we wanted them to be, understand this idea of living in deep relationship with, a reciprocal relationship with the land. And they recognized that within the territory that their school was on, it had been, taken over by some invasive species that were not natural to the, to the area and decided to um, take those species out and to replace them with species that lived in harmony with the cedar tree naturally in that particular area. And um, we went and we took out the, some of the, the blackberry that was there and made paper. And we used that paper to journal our stories of the cedars. So that was a, a really great way for the students to really feel that connection. I also know that with Goldstone, with the math project, um, the students did feel a real deep sense of belonging, not only to the community that they were learning from and with, but that they felt that they understood more of who they were and their identity that they had within that community, um, both uh, within the school, within their class, and then sort of in the larger community. So it was a really powerful moment for them to be able to make those connections. Mm, so nice. Um, and David uh, Barnum said, nature is teacher, basically, mm -hmm. right? So connected. Um, I'm going to answer the next question because it's, it's relevant to me. But Lucy asked, do you think this resource can be adapted to use at a summer camp where you don't have an academic focus? I run them. I do that. I use the walking <laughs> curriculum. I use the engaging ecological imagination in all of the things. 100%. Go, Gillian. I was invited to be a keynote at the BC Camping Federation or something. And it was just a hoot because I went there and I actually ran into my old camp counselor from like 20 years ago. But anyway, no, there's the programs where they're investigating, inquiring, engaging with the natural world, 100%, not necessarily with a K-12 formal environment, yeah. And when you're out there doing this inquiry-based inquiry adventures I, I class them as adventures then they are learning and growing and deepening and building um you know physical mental social well-being academic well-being interactions all of these things i i run summer camps and i use these resources um yeah. it's 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 a treasure okay we're going to dive in a little bit so i've got a couple of different points that i'm going to mix together into one question so samantha says as a non-native person 
How do I help my students learn about the first people's principles whilst being on a walk? And Selena had made another question later on where she said, I appreciate your focus on reciprocity and connecting with the lands. What are your thoughts about negotiating the concern around culture being taught by non-Indigenous educators? Recognising this is a heavy topic, it's one I face every day and so many other teachers that I connect with face every day whenever we're learning outside. Uh, Selena finished with, I'd love to hear about your process, any concerns you had during the writing and any thoughts you might have to guide non-Indigenous educators so they don't wander too close to the important line. Such fabulous question. What so question. that's like um, a poem. That was beautiful. yeah, right. I like I I really enjoyed delivering that yeah. as if it were my own. Um. <laughs> that's yeah. There's so much there, and and maybe give me an email and we can go in deeper. But um, <laughs> in the next minute, uh, essentially, the first people's principles of learning. As the educator, it's really important for you to do that, that learning first, and we would highly recommend that you take a look at the Finesque website, which was the um, developer of the First Nations, um, uh, of the First Peoples Principles of Learning as part of a curriculum development for in 2006 for the English First Peoples um, program that was being put together with the Ministry of Education here in BC. And as a result of this particular framework that came out, this guided understanding, this way in which we can model learning from an Indigenous perspective, Joe Crona, who is sort of our leading expert in the work, created a blog, and it's called First People's Principles of Learning.wordpress.com. And I highly recommend that you go on to that and you do some of your own learning and reading um, prior to just jumping into the work, right? So it's really important as, as the um, leads in the walk that you, you do some of the advanced learning. In terms of being a non-Indigenous educator or someone who is non-Indigenous working with Indigenous knowledge, uh, from a curricular perspective, we're actually not teaching the culture in the classrooms unless you are bringing someone in. What you are doing is you're teaching the history, you're teaching the um, understanding of place, you're teaching and guiding the learning from an Indigenous perspective. So we're not saying you need to teach the culture that needs to be left to um, someone from that particular culture to come in and do right we always want to be making sure that we're not appropriating someone else's knowledge. Uh, and then thinking about where do you where do we go with that um, when we're thinking about taking it out onto the land. It's it's having the modeling of the first people's principle through the walk right so each walk provides a little bit of that perspective a little bit of background around what it might be. And then taking that and thinking about what that might look like and sound like from the First People's Principles perspective, right? So thinking about learning, it's about identity and understanding what do we mean when we talk about identity, for example, and then being able to model that as you go through. Um, I can honestly say just as a, a Caucasian woman, settler, um, it's very, very important that we walk carefully in this work but the part that I understand and I've learned from Heidi is I have to walk in this work I can't not that that's not helping reconciliation so um, for me um, and when I'm talking about the walking curriculum and this further um, elaboration of the walking curriculum I am talking about my growing understanding of this particular first people principle and how this particular walk can help us make sense of this first people's principle and I'm never, I've never arrived, and I don't mean that in a performative way, but I literally will never arrive as a, as a settler who's learning day by day. So uh, for me, I feel, I feel very happy and fortunate to have someone like Heidi to work with me. And I know there are incredible resources within all of your districts um, for you to walk with someone. And I think that's really important. And then as uh, Vicki Kelly always says to me at Simon Fraser University, are you going into the work with an open heart? And if you're doing the work with an open heart as a settler, that is incredibly important. So those are my two cents. And keeping in mind that, you know, when you think about Indigenous knowledge and history, every community, every First Nation, Inuit or Métis community will have their own history, knowledge, culture, protocols. And we we need, I know that the First People's Principles provides it in sort of a um, more of a, a wholesome way of looking at it, a holistic um, way of looking at it, but every community in which you're working and learning from will have 
local knowledge that can be embedded. And the only, there's, there's no way to learn all of it, um, but there's a way to begin it. And there's a way to continue that learning. So even as someone who identifies as First Nations, um, it's not something that I will ever feel like I can be able to, to be able to do. So I know this much of this much, and it doesn't matter how much I continue to learn. I will always only know that much because the knowledge is always growing and changing, right? Really important. So to just finish off on that, but before we do a little close, soft close on the hour, and then um, it looks like we've got lots of questions and discussions still coming, so we can stay around for another five or ten minutes after the hour if people want to dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, but Noel was saying that there was um, a comment made by Heidi earlier that says making things better for Indigenous people as part of this work. And you just maybe covered it there a little bit with identifying as First Nations. Um, but could you elaborate a little bit on that for somebody who's not quite sure how this work ties in with making things better? Yeah, so just thinking about the relationship, the history of the relationship with Indigenous peoples across the nation, um, it hasn't always been a strong relationship. It hasn't always been a positive relationship. You know, at the very beginning, we acknowledged the Moosehide campaign. We acknowledged the day for murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. You know, I mentioned that we are amongst many communities waiting for the return of our loved ones who remain in unmarked graves at Indian residential schools and institutions. We know there is so much that we need to do to make these relationships right and to make them better and to be respectful of them. And I think that part of the work for everyone is to be able to develop some of these relationships. And to do that, we need to do learning and we need to be open-minded, have an open heart, open mind, and really come at the work um, in a good way. And, and if we can do that, then we will create opportunities and a place for reconciliation to happen. And, and we can share that with the young ones because they're the ones that are gonna change the way in which those relationships continue to develop. Right? We can provide that opportunity, but it'll, it'll be our young ones that actually make that change. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. As a non-Indigenous person who's building relationships with Indigenous knowledge keepers uh, where I live through the work that I do, I've had lots of conversations about fear um, and not speaking not sharing resources especially those who've been written in books for example or published or offered for sharing that that there's not enough indigenous people to share message anymore and so we have to unite in uplifting indigenous voice uh, and whether that's learning indigenous language even just to be polite or to say hello to your class or to learn the basic numbers which um i'm doing in tanaha right now but but those things is I've been told just get over the guilt, get over, you know, it's recognize it, sit with it, but stop using that as an excuse not to help uplift our voices going forward. Um, be an ally means opening your mouth. And so that's my personal experience with it. And it's uncomfortable and I make mistakes. I say the wrong thing plenty of times, but doing that and getting over that fear is just huge. Yes, Gillian. Just two, two parts here. Um... One is that I like to call myself uh, an awkward ally <laughs> with Heidi and other indigenous people because I am an ally, I'm an accomplice, but I, I can mess up and not realize why or how. And the other one, I'm not sure who told it to me, but you have to do this work with intention and you will be in tension. And it's just so, it's so true. Um, and uh, it's great work, so thank you. One of my language teachers is in the room. She just said, she's sukini. Thank you, Insamaha. Nice sukini to you for sharing your knowledge. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop for just a second. Um, it's so deep, We could, and I, and I wanna continue, and I hate to, to pull away from that really deep and meaningful and important conversation, um, but some people have got to go, and I do have a couple of things I have to do as part of my job, and then we can get back into the beautiful conversation. Um, so just to let you know, thank you for joining us for this workshop. We have um, three left, or 
two left in the series and you can join in for a monthly campfire connection. Uh, this is a virtual gathering uh, with the Global Environmental Outdoor Education Council and other outdoor learning partners, um, June 2nd, and there'll be another one. And May 26th, we're talking about um, reducing food waste in schools. June 9th, we close this series with indigenous learning resources for educators and learners um, with a few different indigenous partners that we uh, work with at the store. Um, you can register and I'm going to put in, um, Steph's going to put in a bunch of links to the walking curriculum, um, um, the walking curriculum in French, uh, engaging imagination in ecological education, which is a practical strategies for teaching beautiful, um, accessible pedagogical book. Uh, if you're looking for something to really shape uh, the links to Imagined, uh, to Noe, I don't know if that's how I pronounce it in its short um, um and again uh to this free resource okay i have two copies of the walking curriculum to give away and, and steph's got two taken outside t-shirts so um i'm just going to ask you this is a quiz you type in the chat first person to get the correct answer wins uh the t-shirt so what percentage according to science um does walking boost creativity by so walking can boost creativity by a certain percentage fiona tunma you got it 60 percent apparently uh so go outside for walking and improve your creativity by 60 percent fiona i've got your name i'm going to send you an email um where you can order your free copy of the walking curriculum uh, my second question so fingers at the ready is uh, how long do you need to walk for in order to curb sugar or other cravings? Oh, I'm gonna scroll back up. I feel like I saw it. Oh, see, I've, I've done two with numbers, so it's, uh, it's tricky. The correct answer is 15 minutes. So hang on, Brent Mansfield. 15 minutes you got it correct sir and uh, another copy of the book is winging its way to you um steph two t-shirts perhaps we'll do this one um just in a sort of more equitable uh spin through and i'm gonna land on tonya sharer Tonya Shera, if you're still here. Woohoo, congrats. Hopefully she's, or hopefully they're still here. Nice, send me a message in the chat so I know you're here. And then the final, another take me outside. These are ethically made Canadian produced t-shirts that are the softest thing to grace your skin. <laughs> Beautiful message. Kim Barker. Kim Barker, you're the winner of the second take me outside t-shirt. Thank you to everyone uh, who joined us today. I'm sorry if you didn't win. There's a lot of people here um okay so again check your spam by tomorrow morning it will be there email with the recording there's a form to get a certificate of attendance if you're using this for professional development and there'll be a whole heap of lease links linked to the workshop uh, to the resources mentioned in this workshop that's it i think that's all my um housekeeping that i had to do um <laughs> Tonya, I was pulling food out of the oven and heard my name. Yes, you're a winner, um, a t-shirt, and Steph's going to connect with you about uh, winning your prize. Um, and I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup, Sukini, um, and Skin Coots. Uh, no, that's coyote. I would say cook's jam. Cook's jam. Thank you uh, in, in the language here to say thank you for everything you've done today. And uh, let's dive back into a little bit of question time. If anyone wants to stick around, um, I have a couple more questions for you. But thank you again for a fantastic presentation. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Noah. Okay, so Jennifer asks, I love using the walking curriculum with secondary students as well. That's another yes, one. thank you. I wondered if there's any post-secondary instructors in the house, but we need to shift into that demographic a little bit more, I think. Anyway, sorry, Jade, what was the question? <laughs> no, but that's so important. Um, did you say the other walks were also on the Weebly page with the first people's principles of learning connections? The first 30 is what Heidi and Nadine put. The first, you know, that if you're familiar with the word resource, there's those quick and easy 30 at the beginning. 
those are on there. The remaining 30 are not. More work Amazing. to be done. Need more hours in the day. <laughs> um, Fiona says, is there one walk that would lend itself well to a coastal walk along a saltwater beach? She's in within walking distance of the coast. They're also they're also geographically applicable. They're sort of sort of omnivorous or ubiquitous. <laughs> they can go where. What do you think, Heidi? I mean, there's so many that would work because we're at the coast as well, and I'm right down at the beach. And we just had a whole bunch of um, K ones down here today that were out doing some walks and looking at the lovely and lovely and looking at. Um, uh, human impact was a really big one down at the beach today as well. Um, there's just, there's so many, there's, you know, the line walks, borders, every, there's so many different ways in which it's very open-ended. It's not meant to be specific to one particular area. And how amazing to do uh, almost like a comparative uh, study of let's do the lines walk uh, around our infrastructure, and then let's take it mid road and then let's take it to the coast so many of them you can use then to dive deep into uh, you know the comparisons between different landscapes so all of them is the answer okay any more questions here coming in lots of people just very excited to dive in um katie did ask or lily asked what picture books do you use for pre-kindergarten do you have any specifically uh, is that within regards to teaching about reconciliation or is that just sort of in general around? I think in general. In general. I think in general. Well, somebody's oh asked me about um, walking. The, a lot of educators have our books that go well with each walk and they would love a resource that pairs books to walks, but we haven't got that far yet. More hours, more days. But it would be um, a wonderful way, something to share among people that use this resource. And then the layer, as Heidi was saying, with the Indigenous books by Indigenous authors legitimately would be a great resource to develop as well. Beautiful. I just wanted to answer your thing. Um, Julia, Tamara says, Gillian, when I was an FA at SFU, I used the walking curriculum with her student teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Great <laughs> success. Okay. Melissa asked, do you have suggestions for the best resources to gather information on the history and culture of parks? Uh, she's asked, especially in the Vancouver, BC area, for example, when we visit these spaces with our classes. I mean, I would, I would first lean into, you know, what does the community offer on their website? A lot of, a lot of the smaller parks will be on the community websites. Uh, there's also quite a few different websites that offer um, some history to different places you can go for the walks and some of the places even have now posts with QR codes that you can sort of take a look at um, and then of course Parks Canada <laughs> yeah. some of the bigger parks right um, yeah it just I think it really just depends where you're where you're at and what kind of a park you're looking at if it's a municipal or to add on to that, one of the things I found really successful, I mean, we have these um, Northwest Pacific Northwest ID cards. We have laminated kid proof uh, pocket sized field guides where you can look for the plants, animals, um, species for your area. And we have them across uh, North America. Um, and so just taking that and then let them investigate do I have what the card tells me that I should have? How many of these can I find? What's missing and why might it be missing? Um, and that kind of thing. So letting the, the sort of field guides guide you uh, rather than saying, well, we should see this and that, and well, this is what happens here. Just a personal thought. Renee asked, are they available in French? Um, not at this moment. They do have the indigenous, several indigenous languages on the back. Uh, so they're in English, the Latin and uh, indigenous languages. Those cards were originally created by the First Nations Health Authority and they were big and they were amazing. And um, they couldn't get them published. And Terry Mack from Strong Nations agreed to take on that work and has put them into kid size um, laminated copies and they are fantastic and you can actually because it gives different sections on the back you can divide it up depending on which region you're in 
uh, particularly here on the on the northwest coast and Gwen Ayal knows that they're not in French and she would like them in French. <laughs> <laughs> I see that was a push. It was a push. It was a, it was a little see. bit of a reminder. Yeah. Oui, je suis d'accord. Peut-être. <laughs> um in the future we keep keep the feedback coming the more feedback we have the more we can communicate to the powers that be um so it's really important thank you for sharing uh, the link there um and we do have yeah links to some really beautiful other indigenous resources or indigenous created resources um that help guide you on adventures that have more of a picture book that you could use i use it as a sort of a hook to start my my day or my walk or my adventure and then dive into the walking curriculum just with these short walks that we see where it takes us and um, let the students guide the experience. Okay, um, Heidi asks for Heidi and Gillian, how do you highlight the concept of connection between place and wellness of the world uh, without making it sad? i.e. this sort of um, eco-anxiety that I'm seeing with a lot of my students, even little ones. Um, any thoughts on that? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a huge question, right? So yeah, as both Jillian and I go, hmm. um, um, no doom and gloom before grade four is the general rule, <laughs> right? No, no deep sadness. I think, oh, go ahead, Heidi. No, go Jillian. I just, if I'm going back to some of the original work I was doing around imaginative ecological education, this world is wonderful and we should be cultivating a sense of um, compassion and awe uh, in relationship with the natural world and develop the kind of stance that we know through research ends up leading to a conservation ethic and action. So um, I would, it, for me, it's all about developing emotional connections, love, appreciation, awe, beauty, um, respect for the leaf, the, the plant, the tree, all of those other members of our community. So it's not about describing the, the, the scary parts at this point, it's about developing emotional connections for what is here right now, I think. And it's funny because that's, I think that's where I was sort of pausing is I don't, I'm trying to recall when I, I, I go down that sort of route that, that creates sadness. And I, I don't think I actually do. I always look at connections made through story that really highlight our traditional ecological knowledge based on where we are and being able to use that to, um, to really emphasize the value of, of the land and, and of mother earth and, and what it can offer if we are able to have that relationship where we can care and, and as a result, um, be able to use what is offered for us. And so we really focus a lot on the, that relationship around the traditional ecological knowledge and wisdom uh, for everything that we can find, whether it be living or non-living. And, and that creates that sense of belonging and a tied connection through the emotions that we have with the land and then allowing that to happen and filter through with the stories. Students start to feel the sense of peace when they're outside and they ask to be outside. And that's that wellness part that we're talking about, that desire to be outdoors, to be connecting with nature, to be connecting with the land and to be thinking about that relationship in a really positive way, that's that's where we want to go. That's beautiful. I'm just reminded I've been reading this with my students. This is Sila and the Land. It's written by three young Indigenous women and, and um, illustrated by another Indigenous woman from different. I wonder if I can just read you like a paragraph from it because I feel like it's just a beautiful way. Um, I wish I had didn't have my background on, but it's really beautifully illustrated with these lovely pictures. Um, but Sila's on this adventure and she says, um, she's, she's just met a salmon. And she says, well, what do you do then once you return home, asked Sila. And the salmon says, we share the experience we gained with others. We share the knowledge we have gained with each other so that others will learn as well. So do not forget to return home and to reflect on your journey as well as on what you experienced and share what you learned with the people around you. Will you do that for me, little one? And Sila thought of how proud grandmother will be when she tells her of the story of her adventure. She smiled at the salmon and agreed, of course, I will remember to share my knowledge. And, you know, salmon is a big 
thing we've dammed a lot of our rivers there's a lot of controversy around salmon but this is just a story about knowledge and focusing on what you can take from something in a positive sense anyway i'm reading this book with every student that i possibly can at the moment i hold it dear to my heart and we did a podcast actually with ariana who's one of the authors it's on the website uh, and you can listen to the passion and for her it was so important it was the first time she'd really seen um indigenous perspectives be represented in a book that somebody could read at school so that was huge okay i'm going to see if there's anything last um let's have a look someone sharing the cedar in the land thank you so much I think I think we've reached we've reached the end. I want to say again that my deepest gratitude for your knowledge, for your care, for the efforts that you put in to training and supporting the next generation of educators and thus an engaged and powerful next generation of people for our planet. So I'm thank you deeply from the bottom of my heart for the work you're doing. Uh, and I think you know the 80 people who stayed you know, way last into their evening to, to stick around to hear what you had to say is, is representative of that. And I'd just like to reiterate, thank you so much. Thank you, Jillian, for always bringing me out of my comfort zone and making me do things. <laughs> she does that, doesn't she? <laughs> oh, she's good at that, yeah. <laughs> and that in itself has been a reciprocal relationship. Yeah, having a coffee with you later. Um, but thank you so much. We're really grateful for all of your time tonight and be well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.